Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first in a series of aquaculture-related webinars designed to bring together science and business to expand and strengthen the United States aquaculture industry. These webinars are a joint effort between the National Aquaculture Association, the North Central Regional Aquaculture Center, and the United States Aquaculture Society. Whether you're currently engaged in aquaculture, looking to get into business, an educator helping others understand aquaculture, or just want to become a better educated consumer, we hope that these webinars will enhance your knowledge and move you forward on your journey to success. Today's webinar is Aquaponics, How to Do It Yourself, and will be presented by Alan Patillo, who is a fisheries and aquaculture specialist at Iowa State University and also serves as the chair for the North Central Regional Aquaculture Center. Alan is a busy guy working to provide public education and outreach for aquaponics, recirculating aquaculture systems, pond management, local foods, and aquaculture business development. Alan has been involved in aquaculture for more than 10 years and has spent the last five years researching and working with aquaponics. Alan is one of the new generation of aquaculture specialists, and I think that you'll see he's been quite innovative in his aquaponics exploits. He and his team played a big role in getting this aquaculture webinar series rolling, and we owe him a big thank you. So thank you, sir, and now I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Dave, and thank you for that very warm and, uh, and generous welcome. Um, first today, uh, I want to talk about what aquaponics is um, and also give you an idea of what some of the benefits are for it. So just as a sort of a starting point for those of you who may not know, um, aquaponics is the integration of aquaculture, which is growing of aquatic organisms in a controlled environment, wastewater treatment, which is using uh, solids removal as well as as biological means of, of converting toxins in the water into a non-toxic form, as well as hydroponics, which is the growing of plants in a non-soil medium. Uh, you can describe aquaponics as perhaps an artificial ecosystem with a lot of the benefits that you get of a full overall ecosystem production method is a closed loop agricultural system, which means that we're utilizing our waste resources and returning those into the system in order to get um, some benefits out of that economically. Uh, it's a very low environmental impact compared to some other forms of agriculture, and it's also high yielding potentially, depending on the scale that you're going with and if you have the right growing environment. So some of the benefits of aquaponics are that uh, you do have this nutrient management technique that you can utilize. Um, we're able to reduce our effluent going into the environment. Uh, that's gonna help us be in compliance with the Clean Water Act, with the EPA. Um, you can also reduce your expense of effluent filtration and that mitigation process, as well as getting some uh, economic benefit out of those. And also you're maintaining a high water quality for your fish as well as your plants. Additionally, we get uh, enhanced growth rates of the plants. Uh, we've seen approximately twice the amount of growth rate out of our plants in an aquaponic system as compared to say in the soil. Uh, you get prolonged individual plant life, especially whenever you're growing indoors in a controlled environment and you can grow year-round which allows you to hit some target markets that you wouldn't otherwise be able to get especially winter markets where prices are higher for those plants the value of the plants in an aquaponic system tend to make up the majority of the sales that you will get so maybe 75 percent of the total revenue that you'll get out of uh, your aquaponic business will be coming from the plant side also, this adds to your frequency and consistency of, the, of the, uh, the revenues that you're generating. This helps you pay your employees. It helps you keep the lights on, you know, and also you're getting some variety so that you're able to market different products at a more consistent basis, making your business overall more sustainable. You're also able to reduce the footprint of your system, or of your overall agricultural process. Um, because the nutrients are always um, suspended in the water column, we're actually able to use less space per plant so we can grow those plants more tightly packed. 
uh, one of our first limitations actually in an aquaponic system is going to be light. So uh, these vertical production methods also allow us to take advantage of three-dimensional space instead of just the square footage inside of a greenhouse or other growing environment. And so this allows us to be very, very intensive in terms of our agricultural production. Uh, reduced water consumption is a benefit for sure. Uh, on, the, on the fish side, our most efficient method in terms of water would be recirculating aquaculture systems, which typically use between 5 and 15 percent uh, of, their day, uh, of their total system volume will on a daily basis be put down the drain, effluent out into the environment or through a wastewater treatment facility. Um, an average would be 10%. In an aquaponic system, we're able to continue to utilize that water because we're filtering out some of the toxins like nitrate that you would uh, be building up in sort of a recirculating uh, re aquaculture system. Uh, these rates may uh, that you might put out into the environment or you know through a wastewater treatment would be between 1.4% daily. Uh, to three percent on a daily basis you might be adding these so a considerable water savings there on the fish side and then on the plant side we're seeing that uh, romaine lettuce production for example uh, in irrigated agriculture in California which is very typically what where that romaine lettuce is going to be grown for the whole nation uh, we're seeing people using between 10 and 35 gallons per meter square per day to grow those crops, whereas in aquaponics, we might be using more like two to three gallons per meter square per day to grow the same crop. And so we're seeing between 78 and 94 uh, percent water usage reduction. And this is also that data is based on um, some production that was done in Saudi Arabia. So obviously in a desert environment, water is very important. So uh, good water savings there. We also see reduced soil pathogens. Uh, a lot of the uh, soil-borne soil -born pathogens that attack the plant roots are, are, are eliminated from these systems, but you know, some things like pith, pythium, for example, are still going to be able to make it in the water, but it's by and large a much, much less stressful environment for the plants to grow in than it would be in the soil. We also see reduced labor cost. Uh, you can have combined efficiency between the aquaculture and the hydroponic production methods uh, so that you're, you're using less employees to do more work. Uh, there's potential for automation in these sorts of systems so you don't have to have people touching things quite as much. Reduce your labor costs there. Uh, you can grow the plants at whatever height that you want to. Uh, this can be multiple layers or it could be just you know a, a workbench so that your employees don't have to uh, to bend over and work. You know, so that's less that's more of a risk management also in that area. So one of the things that I really appreciate about it is that there's not any weeding in an aquaponics system, which is uh, a okay in my book. Uh, now I want to talk about some aquaponics aquaponic management considerations, especially here in the north central region where we don't have access to a, a perfect environment for growing like you would have say in the Virgin Islands or, or in Hawaii. Uh, temperate environments really create some, some challenges for us for growing because of the extreme shift in temperature. We have degree, day, days that are over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which is not great for most plants, especially lettuce. We have days that are below zero Fahrenheit, which is really too cold to grow anything. So uh, we need to put our systems inside of a controlled environment in order to grow during a longer season. And to take advantage of that seasonal crop production where prices might be higher for somebody that's looking to get some revenue out of those. Uh, also to keep in mind the fish and plant combinations is important. Uh, in terms of temperature, light conditions, salinity, the nutrient requirements for the plants, as well as the water quality tolerances for the fish, market outlets, and whatever your market preferences are of the people uh, that you're trying to target, availability of things like the, the fry, fingerlings, the feed, those sorts of things uh, that you would need to grow these particular organisms, as well as the price and economic viability that you're going to get out of those plants and fish that you will be growing. Uh, designing your system 
uh, should use uh, the, the feed because that is your nutrient source going to your plants. You should really keep in mind the relationship between those two things. So uh, generally, it, it's going to be between 60 and 100 grams of feed per meter square growing area per day. And that was information developed by Dr. Ricosi out of University of Virgin Islands using a 35% protein fish feed, using tilapia as the species of choice. Um, there's, there may be some variability there depending on the species of fish as well as the protein content of the feed, uh, but that's a good rule of thumb. Uh, that feed that you're putting into the water does have an impact on the water quality, and the water quality is the name of the game for growing fish. If you have poor water quality, you're probably going to have sick or dead fish. Um, whenever you add, say, a kilogram of feed into the water, you're going to use between 0.25 and 1 kilogram of oxygen. You're also going to use between 0.18 and 0.4 kilograms of alkalinity in order to process that. And the components that you get out of the water after processing are carbon dioxide, uh, solid waste, and ammonia. The, all those things need to be either removed from the water or processed in a way so that they're not toxic to the fish. Solids removal is very important. Approximately 25% of all of the solids, uh, all of the feed that you give your fish are gonna turn into solid waste and they need to be removed because they can deplete oxygen, uh, clog up your pipes, cause uh, explosions of bacteria growth that you're not trying to promote, uh, cause ammonia problems, other things like this. Um, so mechanical filtration is the way to get those larger solids out of the water. You wanna do this in a way that minimally clogs the pipes. Uh, also, automatic cleaning would be really nice if you have that option, but it is expensive. So on the bottom, you, you can see different types of, of methods here. Uh, this is gonna be things like, this is a, a filter pad. These are gonna be inexpensive, but you have to clean them on every day or every other day. Um, this one here, this is a clarifier. Uh, with a bath full in the middle is more of a passive type system. The water comes in, goes down, uh, allows the solids to settle out at the bottom, and the clarified water goes to the top and out. Needs about a 20 minute retention time inside this vessel in order for to get the solids removal that you're looking for. It's not foolproof by any means, but it is simple. Uh, this is a sand filter or bead filter. This provides uh, both solids filtration as well as biological filtration in the water, but it does require backwashing and it can get clogged periodically if, if you ignore it. More expensive here, uh, probably the most efficient but also the most expensive is going to be this here. This is the uh, micro scream drum filter. Uh, this particular unit costs about $60,000, but and so for a small scale producer, it's not going to be something that you can really afford, most likely. But this particular unit is hooked up to about 60,000 gallons of fish water, um, so it makes it viable that way. Okay, water quality is something that we're looking at on a daily basis, a uh, weekly basis, and a monthly basis. Uh, the things that are going to kill your fish the most quickly is going to be dissolved oxygen, uh, pH, and ammonia. Uh, on a daily basis, we're looking at dissolved oxygen. That matters for, for every organism in the system. Temperature is very important for regulating the growth rates, uh, as well as whenever those fish may get sick or the bacteria may start dying off or the plants aren't growing optimally. The pH is also critically important. I'll explain that quite a bit in a moment. Uh, ammonia nitrogen is the second, probably second most important factor in these systems in terms of keeping everything alive. Uh, we will monitor total ammonia nitrogen, nitrite, nitrate, and alkalinity on twice a week um, so that we can make sure our system's good and in balance. And then, then twice monthly, we'll, we'll look at things like phosphorus, iron, calcium, and potassium. Those are going to be the components uh, that are nutrients for the plants that may be lacking in the water. Uh, biological filtration is the process of changing uh, toxic ammonia over into nitrite. Um, and that, that'll be a bacterial process that that goes through. Uh, and then changing from nitrite into nitrate uh, through this process, another type of bacteria. And then going from nitrate 
through the plants. They'll be taking up the nitrogen components and then that water will be filtered by the plants and goes back to the fish. Surface area is critically important. Uh, the more surface area you have, the more bacteria that can attach to the surface area uh, and the more uh, space for nitrification that can occur. Other types of bacteria are going to also compete for that space, like heterotrophic bacteria. So you're looking to minimize those, but also just have enough surface area there uh, so that you're processing all those nitrogen components uh, quickly and efficiently. Uh, these organisms do need food as well in order to uh, do the nitrogen cycle. So ammonia and nitrite do need to be present in the water for you to have those bacteria. Uh, recommended at least 0.07 milligrams per liter, which is basically negligible in terms of the fish, but for the bacteria, you're going to need those. Good living conditions for those uh, bacteria, you're going to need dissolved oxygen at least 4 milligrams per liter. Uh, preferred pH for for biofiltration is between 7.2 and 8.8. .8. I'll show you a little bit later how that uh, how we have to manage for that. Uh, alkalinity, we're going to need 200 milligrams per liter would be ideal, uh, but a minimum of 40 milligrams per liter in order to do biological filtration. This is a relationship a table that shows the relationship between pH temperature. And ammonia toxicity. So let's just go through this example quickly. So 20 degrees Celsius is approximately room temperature and a pH of 7 is neutral and you'll see here at, at room temperature and pH 7 about 0.4 percent of all of the ammonia, the total ammonia nitrogen, is going to be in the toxic form which is not a lot. But you'll see in greenhouse conditions we can get up to 32 degrees Celsius fairly easily but if we're still at a pH 7, we're looking at 1% um, of that total ammonia nitrogen is going to be in the toxic, unionized form. Um, as the pH, in, or the pH increases, we'll get up to here to pH 9, which sometimes we do have city water in Ames, where I'm at. Uh, the city water comes in at pH 9 because it's artificially been adjusted, so it's very important to know what the incoming pH of the water is. At pH 9 and 32 degrees Celsius, which we'll see sometimes in the summer, about almost 50% of all of the ammonia is going to be in the toxic form. So if we're having issues getting uh, the water filtered and our biofilters down, we may get up to like say 3 milligrams per liter of total ammonia nitrogen. Suddenly 50% of that is in the toxic form and 1.5 milligrams per liter of ammonia in the toxic form, your fish are most likely going to be dead. So it's very important to keep the pH at, at neutral if possible, uh, as well as a little bit cooler temperature. We'll give you some leeway there. Aeration is very important uh, in these systems. Dissolved oxygen is used by the plants, by the fish, and by the bacteria, and we try to maintain at least five milligrams per liter. Ideally, we'll be at the saturation level at all times. Uh, but keep in mind that warm water doesn't hold as much oxygen as cold water, uh, so it's harder to keep at saturation, especially in warm temperatures and especially whenever you have a lot of fish and bacteria growing. There's always a biological oxygen demand, so if you're having issues keeping air, uh, oxygen levels up, more aeration as well as um, cooling down the water will help. Additionally, uh, feed, feeding consistently is very important because your feed is your fertilizer for your plants and because your plants make up the majority of the revenue source for your aquaponic business, you're going to want to have your feed, uh, your fish stocking at sort of a staggered, uh, have it staggered in the system. So just take this for example, we'll have multiple rearing tanks, say there's four rearing tanks here. We add fish into tank one at week zero. Uh, we'll grow those for 24 weeks before they get to harvest. So at week zero, we'll add them here. At week six, we'll add them here. At week 12, we'll add them here. And at week 18, we'll add them here. And by the time we reach week 24, then we can harvest tank one and then simultaneously put another batch of juvenile fish in here. This allows us to creep up slowly in terms of our biomass that's in the system, allows our bacteria to establish very well, and for us to always have good biological filtration. Another way to do this is to have one large tank 
and then have multiple cohorts of fish growing simultaneously. Uh, you can use something like this, uh, this greater mesh um, net here where the larger fish will be retained inside the net, the smaller fish can swim through it and you can harvest your large fish whenever you need to. But keep in mind, every time you handle these fish, there's potential for stress and disease and those sorts of things. Uh, and it can be, it can, you can lose your crop that way. So uh, this is the less preferred method than using multiple rearing tanks. Also keeping your plant density constant is important because they're providing that critical filtration for your fish. Um, whenever you remove those plants, you remove your, your filtration ability. And so uh, we like to have multiple cohorts of plants always going through the system. So here's an example of what that might look like. Uh, in week zero, we would sow our seeds into, say, in our system, rock wool cubes. Uh, those would be in a plant gro uh, growth area over here. And then we'll grow those for two weeks. So this would be week one. This would be week two. And by the time we get to week three, they should, the plants should be large enough to then put into the system. So transplant right here at the beginning of week three, and then we grow those for week three, four, five, and six. Uh, keep in mind every week we're adding new plants at week three into here at the transplant size. We're moving the next week down and down and down, and we're harvesting here at this end of the grow raft. And then at that sixth week, we'll send those off to market. Uh, this way you have staggered production. You'll always have uh, sort of the similar biomass in terms of plants to filter the water for your fish. Uh, now time to talk about pH and how that affects your fish, plants, and bacteria. If you look here, we have the soil pH between four and nine. And these are the different nutrients that are available to the plants. So the wider that this bar is, the more available those plants are for the, or the nutrients are for the plants to take up, rather. Uh, so we'll see here that the fish, we suggest a pH between 6.5 and 9 uh, in order to keep your fish happy. That's a pretty wide range. The plants prefer a pH between 5 and 7 uh, to, in order to maximize the amount of nutrient uptake that they can have. But your bacteria are really going to do the best job of processing the nitrogen components at between 7 and 8.5. So we're seeing an optimal range here between about pH 6.5 and 7.2. So that's what we're trying to maintain in order to keep our fish and our plants and our bacteria as happy as possible. All right, in terms of nutrients that we have to add to the system, uh, fish feed is going to provide the majority of those nutrients, 10 out of the 13 that you'll need. Uh, ones that you'll typically be deficient in, especially if you're using distilled water, for example, rainwater, would be iron, calcium, and potassium. Uh, you, it's not recommended to add just an, an iron source like steel into the water uh, because that's going to rust and it's going to precipitate out of the water. Uh, what you want is a chelated iron, and that's going to allow that to become um, suspended in the water column and stay suspended in the water column and available for your plants. We recommend between 2 and 4 milligrams per liter of chelated iron and to be added every two weeks. Uh, calcium, for us here in Iowa, we have limestone bedrock, so calcium is not really an issue for us. Uh, but in other areas, especially if you're using, like I said, rainwater, uh, calcium won't be in that water, so you'll have to add another source of calcium for your plants. Calcium carbonate, for example, is agricultural limestone, uh, cal uh, but this doesn't dissolve very fast, but it is very safe, and it, and it adds alkalinity into the water, which is a good thing. Uh, calcium hydroxide uh, will shift the, the pH of the water upwards, and it can do it very quickly, especially in poor, poorly buffered water. Um, and calcium chloride dissolves very quickly as well, but keep in mind you're introducing chloride into the water. And for fresh water or um, terrestrial plants, typically, chloride is a very bad thing to add there. So you need to limit that usage. Um, potassium, you have similar issues here. So potassium chloride is a good one that dissolves quickly, but you're adding chloride. Potassium hydroxide, you're adding hydroxide into the water and potential issues there. A nutrient deficiencies uh, will typically show a yellowing in the plant leaves. 
So this one, for example, would be most likely an iron deficiency. We have a green vein of the plant with yellowing in between the veins. Uh, that's very indicative of an iron deficiency, so we need to add chelated iron. This one here, these blotchiness on the leaves, it might be something more like manganese. Uh, managing the sludge in the system. So like I said before, you're adding uh, solids into the water all the time whenever you're feeding, and so that organic matter can break down in the system and, and cause dissolved oxygen problems and other things that you don't really want there. It can kill your plant roots and your bacteria. Some people, uh, and especially in these media bed systems, are adding uh, composting worms in there in order to break down some of those nutrients and keep the sludge levels down. Uh, that's a topic of one of my research projects right now, actually. Other things that you need to do is prevent biofouling. So if your, your pipes clog up, uh, then there's no water getting to your plants or back to your fish. You're causing big problems for yourself. So uh, oversizing your pipes can be important. You know, if you, if you think that you'll need a one inch pipe, you can go to one and a quarter, one and a half. It'll give you more flow and more leeway so that you don't have a heart attack like we have here. Other things to prevent biofouling, uh, avoiding things like spaghetti tubes. The small diameter tube is very likely to clog, although these are very popular for the NFT channels and drip emitters and that sort of thing. Using a much larger diameter hose would be uh, ideal in a situation like this. Uh, some people like to add juvenile tilapia into their system, so these little guys can go through and pick up the, uh, the heterotrophic bacteria that will be growing on the inside of the pipes. Um, but keep in mind, if they go through the pipes and get into your plant beds, they're very likely to eat all the roots up. Uh, they're also, they may die inside there and cause other types of issues. So use caution there when, when using juvenile tilapia in your pipes. Uh, lowering the water temperature also lowers the metabolic rate of all the bacteria and plants and fish. And uh, so you can prevent some biofouling by just lowering the water temperature. Although that may not be an option for some growers. Uh, and periodic flushing of the of the pipes with a high pressure pump um, is something that should just be worked into the uh, into the routine. Using non toxic pest control is important. The pesticides that you might use on your plants are very likely to kill your fish or your bacteria, and likewise, the therapeutics you're using on the fish are very likely to harm your bacteria or your plants. Um, so. It, a word of caution there with that. Some things that we're doing, because there's very few safe treatments, you want to prevent those as much as possible. So something that we're using is biologicals. Uh, these, this here is a sachet of uh, parasitic wasps. So whenever you add these into the system, they hatch out and then they'll fly over and find a host that's munching on some of your plants like we had here. These are caterpillars. So they'll land on the caterpillar, lay its eggs inside of there, and then kill the caterpillar from the inside out, which is uh, kind of gross, but gratifying. Uh, lace wings are another example of this. What these are, they tend to eat white flies and other types of insects, ladybugs, or um, praying mantis might be another option. Diatomaceous earth is something else that we're using. So these are diatoms or single-celled algae that are encased in glass. Uh, there are areas where they can harvest this out from the environment and, and uh, sell that. You can, um, what we'll do in order to control cockroaches in our facility is we'll take sort of a lunch tray and put about a, a quarter inch deep of this diatomaceous earth and then put a sun chip right in the middle of it. And then those, those cockroaches will go and eat the, eat the chip and they'll cut themselves up in that glass and then they'll dry out and die. So that's another way to deal with those. Uh, BT is something that works for caterpillars. Dipel might be a brand that you could use. Uh, these caterpillars here, uh, we were able to, whoops, these caterpillars we were able to spray them with BT, didn't harm the fish or the plants, and able to go ahead and harvest our crop. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is to limit your electrical usage. This is of course, a source of uh, outflowing money. You want to keep as much money in your system as possible uh, for you to benefit off of. Taking advantage of gravity is, a, is definitely to your advantage. Um, also, using only one pump is going to limit the 
likelihood that you're going to have a water flow imbalance. So if you're having two pumps pumping into a container, one of them might be running faster than the other. Uh, so using only one pump is, is to your benefit there. Uh, lowering your electrical usage is beneficial. Also, using vertical space, you can maximize your square footage uh, profit. Now I want to take a moment and describe the system that we're using here at Iowa State University. This has been for the last five years. Um, just kind of show you this was more or less a homemade system uh, using components that we had laying around uh, that were no longer in use. And it seems like it works pretty well. So here's how it works. We're starting up here with the fish tanks. I, again, we're using taking advantage of gravity by pumping the water up to the fish and allowing it to flow by gravity back down. Uh, the solids are removed here uh, through a mechanical filter. This is a filter pad and then down through a biological filter. Uh, and originally the way we had the system um, plumbed, we were going down into the plant grow beds uh, where the water was going to the plants and then draining out of those grow beds back into the sump where the water was pumped and back up to the fish. We also have an aerator blower here in order to provide aeration for our fish and our plants. This is what our fish tanks look like. These are 50 gallon high density polyethylene tanks. They are square. Uh, this is not a problem for tilapia, but other species like yellow perch may not really do too well in square tanks. So it's all up to the species and what you have available. We have our inflow pipe here with a series of holes drilled on this one side. We get directional flow in here. Uh, we have a solids lifting outflow here, uh, which is taking our solids from the bottom. And this is regulating the water height inside the tank uh, as that water flows out. And then we also have an emergency overflow right here. Uh, so if we have our water level gets too high, then that water travels back to the sump rather than onto the floor. We also have an air stone inside here uh, that's, that we're providing aeration. And here's a picture of uh, our fish tank covers. Keep in mind it's very important to keep your fish in the tank. Tilapia are excellent jumpers and apparently suicidal as well. So keeping a fish cover over your tank is very important. Our filter tanks, uh, like I said, we have a solids filter pads right here. Uh, we also have uh, underneath there, we were originally using rock, but we decided we needed more surface area. So we put uh, this biofill material, this is made out of PVC, something that won't break down with high surface area <clears throat> and that uh, will last a long time and doesn't leach anything into the water. So that, that sits here inside of this tank. We have this H-shaped outflow. This is just to give us more surface area of outflow just in case we get clogged up with any sludge. But inside this small box, there's about 52 square meters of surface area in order to do nitrogen processing. Our plant trays are here. These are made out of uh, two by eights. These are eight inches high, 30 inches by 32 inches. We do have a manifold here just so that each of the plants gets uh, equal access to the nutrient rich water. Then we also have a standpipe here. So uh, for our floating raft system, the water gets up to that height and then it flows out of the system. Uh, then this is a, a picture of what it looks like whenever it's in, in operation. These are our sumps here. This is where our water collects at um, from our plant side and our fish side. This right here, this image, we're using a one-third horsepower sump pump with a float switch uh, so that it wouldn't burn itself out whenever the water level gets too low. We have a lot of tra evapotranspiration from the plants. Uh, this pipe goes up. This is a shunt valve. There's a ball valve right here so we can regulate the flow going up to the fish tank. This is up to the fish tank. Uh, this pipe puts the water back into the sump. So the more open this valve is, the more water goes to the sump. The more closed it is, the more that goes to the fish. And this here is our emergency overflow that's coming from the fish tank again. This is the area where we'll also add our nutrient supplements. And the species that we've had luck with so far have been Nile tilapia, Barramundi, um, Moneymaker tomatoes, buttercrunch bib lettuce, and Italian largeleaf basil. Uh, we're also currently working with cilantro and having some luck with those. Uh, looking to expand into some different types of leafy greens and herbs. 
So now I want to take a moment and, and sort of show you what I've seen over the past five years as standards that people are using very commonly in aquaponics and trends that I see people are moving towards trying to become more economically viable. Um, the standard fish for aquaponics would probably be the tilapia, the Nile tilapia is in this image. It's a good warm water fish species, it's very difficult to kill, they're very tolerant of poor water quality. They're fairly widely available and uh, the market accepts them pretty well. Uh, for the cool water or cold water uh, systems, a trout might be a good option. Uh, I've seen some work done with these. Um, some trends in terms of the, the, the fish that are coming out of the systems. Now that I'm seeing koi is a really good option because they're much more valuable per fish and then you can be sold live and you can keep them for a long time inside your system since most of your money's coming from your plants anyway. The fish can stay quite a while and just provide nutrients for your plants. Yellow perch is very popular here in the Midwest, uh, especially because they're, they like the water temperatures that we have in the area. It's very good to use a native fish. Bear Mundi is a species becoming more popular in Iowa. Um, and we have some fish farmers growing those, so I figured I should probably learn how to grow them. Um, sturgeon is another example of a potentially long-lived species as, and that provides a couple of different products like caviar, as well as the meat from those fish. Uh, grass carp is another example of a fish that can be sold live. Uh, triploid grass carp are becoming more and more used these days. Um, red claw crayfish and freshwater prawns might be an example of something you can use to add variety into these systems. Uh, standards in terms of plants, lettuce and other leafy greens, especially basil and other herbs, uh, tomatoes, cucumbers and strawberries are being grown quite a bit in aquaponics with some success. Uh, trends that I'm seeing is going to be microgreens, especially uh, for a much higher end um, audience. Um, edible flowers is another option. Um, I've seen stevia and bok choy, and especially uh, medicinal herbs, which in Iowa, of course, you can't grow, but other states, maybe that's an option. Um, growing methods for your hydroponic unit would be. Uh, floating rafts, media beds, and nutrient film technique, or NFT, uh, with floating rafts definitely being far and away the most commonly used, as well as probably the most foolproof option uh, for growing plants. Some trends that I'm seeing is this vertical production, so seeing NFTs where you've been able to grow uh, multiple levels so you can take advantage of all the space that you have in the greenhouse. Uh, these stack of pots are another option, or even seeing NFTs over the tops of floating rafts is another another way to take up nutrients and uh, and bump up your plant production. In terms of the growing methods, freshwater aquaponics is definitely the standard. Um, most of the terrestrial plants that we grow are not terribly salt tolerant, so uh, freshwater aquaponics and balanced systems. Uh, whenever I say that, that's the nutrients that go into the system with the feed should be equal to the amount of nutrients that are taken out of the system by the plants. And the other option here would be a decoupled aquaponic system. So in this example, this would be a recirculating aquaculture system that would be independent, uh, but somehow connected to an independent hydroponic system. So between this system, there would be a sump area uh, where the water would flow one direction from the fish side over into the sump and never returning back to the fish. Uh, and then the hydroponic unit would take up this wastewater from the fish side and utilize it until it's completely gone. Um, this uh, gives you some leeway in terms of treating your fish and your plants because you can take either of those offline at any time if you need to, which is a huge benefit. Uh, I'm hearing lots of uh, rumblings about saltwater aquaponics now. This would make it possible to grow marine shrimp, which is our, our number one aquaculture product worldwide, um, but we need to look into more salt tolerant plants. Um, I've heard that maybe peppers might be an option here other types of culinary things that could work out, algae would work. 
um, for growing environments, uh, outdoors has been a big one. Our growing inside of a glass greenhouse or, you know, most hobbyists are doing this in their garage or their basement. Uh, things that I'm seeing people do now would be growing in, start, in, in a storefront area, a more compact system that people could go and harvest their own plants right there. This could be inside of a restaurant also. I'm seeing a lot of warehouse growers, uh, especially in the northern regions, because we have, um, you know, unused buildings, say in Detroit or Chicago or other large cities that can be used, converted to aquaponics. A high tunnel greenhouse uh, or cold frame that's covered with plastic uh, is a good way to extend the growing season. Uh, you can do year-round growth in warmer areas this way. Uh, it might be extended season in a lot of the temperate zone, uh, but other polycarbonate greenhouses be less ex sort of in between the, the high tunnels and the glass greenhouse. Seeing a lot of urban settings as well as schools are doing this quite a bit now to teach their students about different aspects of science. Uh, in terms of lighting, uh, sunlight, of course, is, is the best. It's free, but it's not always available. Uh, fluorescent lights is a good way to grow leafy greens. High pressure sodium is a good way to grow leafy greens and fruiting plants, but they can be energy intensive. Things that I'm seeing in terms of trends would be light emitting diodes, LEDs, and induction lighting as well. Uh, in terms of electricity source, solar and wind power are definitely maybe some more sustainable ways to go about um, energy uh, usage in these sorts of systems can get off the grid that way. Other things like the, the heat source using geothermal solar uh, solar water heaters as well as biological um, heat sources like compost or waste also you can get off the grid um, and, and decrease your your constant input of energy costs from these systems uh, and also people are looking all the time for different ways to make money out of these systems by adding additional products uh, that can be sold for market one thing could be the composting worms or fish emulsion I, I hear that people can grow mushrooms somehow in these systems. I'm not sure how that works, but I'm interested to learn. Uh, so after all this, I mean, the main question that most people have is, can aquaponics be profitable? And of course, this depends on a lot of different variables. Uh, those variables from your fixed costs, from your facility, as well as your system that you're putting in, and your operation costs for electricity, heat, labor, those, um, you know, uh, fish and fish feed and those sorts of things uh, and then what your revenue streams are if you have consistent revenue and as if you're making more money for what you're selling than what you're putting into it uh, it's very important to do your due diligence in formulating a business plan and and seeing for sure that it cash flows before getting into this because some people could spend a lot of money and uh, and not get a lot of benefit out of it so we wanted to help answer this question for people, and I partnered with our engineering um, department here at Iowa State and did a techno-economic analysis of our small-scale aquaponics system, looking at capital expenditures, uh, break, break-even points, and potential revenue streams coming out of these systems. So uh, a smarter person than me did this research, thankfully. Uh, this is the model for the system. So we're looking at all of these different inputs that go into the system as well as some outputs like basil and tilapia harvest. And, but all of these inputs that go in and the cycle and how that, how that all works together. Our production's assumptions for these, we were, we were based off of our 2012-2013 production data that we did inside of our greenhouse. Uh, growing Nile tilapia and Italian largeleaf basil. So that's what this is based off of. And it's also based off of the aquaponic system that I described earlier. Has about 7.5 meter square growing area um, and a 50 gallon fish tank um, inside of that system, uh, inside of this size greenhouse. And then we took those numbers and we extrapolated them to 10 times to 300 times the size of this facility. Um, utilizing the appropriate infrastructure at that size uh, to see if we were getting any economic benefit from going to a larger size. Uh, for 
for these business models, this is called economies of scale. Uh, we did see here the production cost for each of those products, being the basil and the tilapia coming out of the system. Uh, we were seeing that the cost to produce an, one single unit decreased really, really fast as our system size grew. So our growing bed area was our variable of interest. Um, so we we're seeing, you know, it dropped off really quick as you got to a larger size facility. Uh, for annual unit profit coming out of these systems, we were looking at uh, this here, this very close would be our small size uh, research scale system. Uh, this would be the 10 times that size system and this would be the 300 times. So you're seeing also here, this center line would be the break even point. Uh, so where you're paying for your expenses, but nothing more. Uh, we're seeing a break-even price for our basil. This is the variable here is the basil production uh, with a constant tilapia price at $9 a kilogram. Uh, we were seeing break-even for the largest system at just north of $20 per kilogram. Uh, and as I blow this up, you can see uh, this is the small-scale system again, and here is the 10 times the small-scale system. Again, here's the break-even point. We're seeing um, potential profitability at anywhere north of uh, $60 per kilogram for the basal price at uh, sort of what I would call an intermediate scale system. Um, and then this, unfortunately, is our small scale system, which would be maybe a hobby scale system, uh, would never ever be profitable no matter what you did, which is good information to know. Conclusions out of this is just larger operation size um, gives you lower cost per unit produced and it can e increase your overall profitability. We recommend at least 75 meter square growing area, uh, which will yield you a break even price um, at $60 per kilogram of basil produ produced. Uh, next, going into the supplemental lighting. So, high pressure sodiums has been the standard for many years for greenhouse growing. And comparing that to LEDs, which is a new technology uh, that uses much less electricity and you get higher um, intensity of light for the plants to grow, gives them the, the light spectrum that they really need. So this is a, perhaps a little bit messy, but looking at LED, this was our uh, average grams per plant. Wet weight of the plants grown under LEDs were about 50 grams on average. Uh, these are the same age, of course, and under high pressure sodiums, they're about 27 grams on average, so about twice the amount of weight produced a plant, which is particularly beneficial since basil is sold by the pound. And then the amount of money it, it costs to run those lights um, with the, the cost of the lights uh, amortized over the lifespan of the light, as well as the electricity usage here. Uh, LEDs were less expensive uh, per year than it was to, to use high pressure sodiums. And this is whenever the LEDs cost $1,000 a piece, when they've come down quite a bit since then. Um, and then, so whenever you look at the, the value of the basil produced in, under the LEDs, about $745 per meter squared, uh, whereas we were seeing about $405 per meter squared benefit under the high pressure sodiums. But whenever you look into the net benefit, taking the cost of those out, we saw that we we're making about $434 per meter squared under LEDs, but only maybe $47 per meter squared under high pressure sodiums, which that's a big deal. Uh, next, I want to shift gears and talk about um, food safety and human health and aquaponics is another project that we worked on. Um, Everybody is responsible for food safety. Uh, everyone from the producers through all the middlemen and onto the consumers in order to clean the product and make sure it's safe for you to eat. Uh, food safety is a concern, especially with the new Food Safety Modernization Act. Uh, aquaponics is a sort of undefined area right now, so we need to do more research to find out what, what issues there are. Uh, but foodborne diseases uh, affect about one in six Americans every year um, and causes about a $77 billion economic burden annually. The concerns with aquaponics is that the waste from the fish is in direct contact with the plants. Uh, potential for cross-contamination is, of course, there. 
Uh, so we want to look into what those risks really are. Uh, generally, fish is not regarded as a food safety threat for aquaponics, especially for E. coli, because the temperature of uh, these fish being cold-blooded are not at a proper temperature to promote E. coli growth. Uh, but other things like salmonella may be able to grow in these systems, uh, and there may be other um, types of pathogens that could be there, but we needed to evaluate uh, what those were. In terms of food safety threats, uh, in numbers of illnesses, hospitalizations, and deaths, um, we'll see that leafy vegetables comes out very high on each one of these, uh, but fish comes out very low. Uh, leafy vegetables and vine stock vegetables are, are also pretty high. Why is this produce so risky? Well, it's because it's consumed raw. Uh, for one, there's no kill step in order to kill that pathogen. It's very wrinkly with high surface area, and they're very sticky also because they're covered in wax. This allows those bacteria pathogens to attach to them and, and get to people more easily. Ways to deal with this is to have good agricultural practices in place for your farm in order to mitigate these issues. So these gaps are going to give plants for the soil, water, hands, and surfaces. So food safety plans will include, or a, a good agricultural practices would include a food safety plan. And your food safety plan is gonna include things like production steps, hazard analysis, control points, monitoring strategies, adjustment protocols, and documentation. Here's a really good link to a publication through our food safety extension specialist uh, that will give you lots of information on food safety and developing a plan. Uh, in our facility, whenever we uh, kill these fish or we harvest them, uh, we want to make sure, especially the warm water species like tilapia and barramundi, uh, we can use an ice bath to kill those. Uh, we'll use a mixture of water and ice and um, salt in order to get the water temperature down very low. And then we'll put the fish inside this ice water slurry uh, and then leave those fish in, in there until their core body temperature is below 37 degrees Fahrenheit. And we'll check that with a thermometer. This will vary from state to state and from country to country. Of course, you'll want to know what the regulations are associated with processing seafood. Uh, plant harvest, again, um, you're going to want to avoid lifting the rafts to get to the plants or pulling the roots out to get to the plants because this area is where the majority of the pathogens could be housed at. Um, the actual leaf matter doesn't tend to have very much there, especially, you know, if it's not being splashed on or anything like that. So harvesting these plants above the root line from above the raft uh, is going to be much safer than um, being having those roots in contact with the plant leaf. Uh, in terms of plant harvest, you're going to need to rapidly cool the plant temperature down to whatever the temperature is that's safe for that particular plant. Uh, basil doesn't do too well in the cold, but uh, lettuce does fairly well um, closer to refrigerator temperatures. Uh, clean that produce appropriately for that particular plant and store those plants under the temperatures where they will be consumed at, uh, where they're safe until they can be bought by consumers. Also, of course, be aware of the processing regulations within your state or country. Uh, in Iowa, you're gonna want to ask uh, the Iowa Department of Inspections and Appeals for that information. Uh, this is my contact information here. Uh, please feel free to contact me directly or uh, through the Brenton Center if you have questions about this. Um, our website is www.ncrac.org. Uh, this is the website where you registered for this. Again, this will be posted online on the NICRAC website so you can view it again at a later date. If my phone number and email, uh, my fisheries extension website for Iowa State here is nrim.iastate.edu slash fisheries. And uh, now I would like to take any questions that you have. Uh, also, I'd like to thank the United States Aquaculture Society, the North Central Regional Aquaculture Center, uh, the, Nor uh, the National Aquaculture Association, and the United States Department of Agriculture for providing funds in order for us to, to host this webinar today.